All right, I'll try not to uh, mess up your slides here. Oh, one minute, I got the one second, hang on. I got the, okay, I got the thumbs up. All right, we're good to go, Amy, great. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone um, here uh, in the auditorium and also uh, joining us on Zoom. My name is Catherine Stoner. I'm the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law and a senior fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute, uh, a political scientist by choice um, and a senior fellow by courtesy at Hoover as well. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, Alexei Hancharok. Um, Alexei is the third Bernard and Susan Leotode visiting fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute. The fellowship uh, was established at FSI by Susan and Bernard Leotode to bring to the Stanford community former leaders uh, in government for a quarter or longer and previous holders of the Leotode Fellowship have been uh, Thomas Ilves, the former president of Estonia, who was our first Bernard and Susan Leotode fellow, um, who was here from 2017 to 2018, and H.R. McMaster, um, who was our second um, Bernard and Susan Leotode fellow from 2019 to 2020. Um, and Alexei, therefore, is our third in 2021, if you're following along. Um, Alexei has been a pleasure to have this quarter um, at CGDRL. Um, he is, some of you will know, Ukraine's 17th prime minister. He served from 2019 to 2020. And in his short time as prime minister, uh, Alexei initiated some of the most important and bold changes um, in Ukraine, particularly in the area of the economy, launching uh, large and small scale privatization processes, establishing a uh, land, agricultural land market, um, unbundling naftal gas, uh, as a unit and um, starting to combat uh, corruption, illegal gambling, um, and um, was a big defender in particular uh, before becoming uh, prime minister of uh, businesses. He headed from 2015 to 2019, the Better Regulation Delivery Office or BRDO. Um, and one of the achievements of BRDO and when he headed it was um, to get rid of about 1,000 different government acts um, that inhibited uh, business activity. He was also an external advisor uh, to the first deputy prime minister of Ukraine for economic development and trade. Alexei has a degree in law from the Interregional Academy of Personal Management and in Public Administration from the National Academy for Public Administration. Um, he also, I should say, uh, was, I think I mentioned, the youngest um, of uh, Ukrainian prime ministers. And at one point, weren't you the youngest prime minister in the world? He was, but then you got, okay, we won't tell. So, but he held that as well, uh, title, uh, for a number of months at least. Um, he is a lawyer. Uh, he is a, 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 a doer. Um, he has been called a workaholic. Um, he is certainly a man of action. Uh, so I will let him jump up on the stage here. Um, and take over. Um, he'll speak and then we'll sit down together and take questions both from our online audience and from those here in the room. Welcome, Alexei. Thank you very much, Catherine, dear friends, colleagues. I'm happy to see you here. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak to you today. I know that it's it's very important topic and very hot topic now, but three, four year, weeks ago, when I only started thinking about this topic, about the name of this topic, uh, it wasn't so hot. Um, and it, there, there was no Russian troops near our borders. And yesterday I discussed 
my today's presentation with my American friend, and he asked me, how do you know this? How did you know this? How you made this like prediction, this foresight? Tell me. And the, my answer was very simple. I didn't. I didn't know, but for me and for Ukrainians, for millions of Ukrainians, uh, the war is very hot topic every day last seven years. And that's why this topic was chosen like a long before this recent crisis started with Russia and Ukraine on our border. I would like to start today's presentation with the short story about this man. His name is Vitaly Pavlisko. He is 48 years old. He's Ukrainian from Yavoriv, a small, very beautiful town. He's a husband and father of two children. And nine days ago, he was killed, uh, November 7, while Russian troops were shelling Ukrainian position. It was, Vitaly was killed during so-called ceasefire in Donbass. And he sacrificed his life for the future of Ukraine, but not only. For the future of all free world. And because Ukraine now is a battleground for democracy in the world. And before I started, I, I will start my lecture, I like to ask you to observe a meal of silence in the memory of all of Vitaly for sure and the memory of all the people who were killed during this terrible war. Thank you. It's a terrible number, actually. More than 30,000 people were killed and more than 1.86 million people were like pressed, forced to leave their homes. But uh, I'm telling you this not, not to create some emotional effect, but to help you to understand why this topic was chosen and why it's so important for me and for my people. Uh, Ambassador McFall, actually, uh, when I asked him about an advice, uh, he like, gave me an advice to start the lecture, this presentation uh, from a personal story. I will do this. I'll, I grew up in a family of Soviet military officer uh, in a small, very small, teeny uh, town in the borders between Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. Belarus. In my childhood, I read not only Russian, or Ukrainian, but Russian books. We had three TV channels, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian. And I played with the kids from these three countries. And I still speak Russian pretty often, and I like Russian culture. I know it perfectly and appreciate it. But I understand that nowadays Russian culture becomes a weapon against my country. And like machine guns and missiles, Kremlin use it to kill people. That's why the Russian attack on Ukraine seven years ago and now has become a personal strategy for me and for million people from my country. I want to maybe let you feel this. Uh, you maybe, everyone you know about the Pearl Harbor, yeah? So imagine that it was the same, it was the same effect for Ukrainians. We were absolutely peaceful nation. We didn't have any some conflicts with Russia. Didn't have, no conflicts, zero. And 
after some event, after some some period of time, we uh, received this this attack from uh, Russia. Why it happened? Because seven years ago in Ukraine, the revolution of dignity was happened. How it was for me personally. Ten years ago, I was a lawyer. I was a successful lawyer, but not very good citizen. Because I, I didn't participate in elections. So I never voted. I saw that it's irrational to spend my time to vote. And it was a terrible mistake. And I paid for this mistake, me and my friends. And I remember very well how Yanukovych and his criminal crowd showed us very quickly uh, that we can lose our freedom in our free country. And we started fighting for our freedom. And after our victory, Ukraine was attacked by Russian troops immediately. So you're just fighting against Yanukovych, you win, you have this like emo emotional moment, and the day, next day you will have uh, the attack from uh, Russia. And we started fighting for our lives. So we fight for our freedom, and now we are fighting for our lives, and still fighting actually. And this war made us stronger and gave us a clear understanding why it happened. And now during this presentation, I will do my best to share with you uh, my knowledge about the reason why it happened. And let you feel that this war relates to everyone in this audience, not only to Ukrainians, to everyone of this audience, because this war started because of our choice. The reason why Russia attacked Ukraine was because Ukraine made democratic choice. Uh, as you perfectly know from the news, for the last few weeks, Russia has been concentrating uh, its troops along the border of Ukraine. And something like 100,000 people, military people. But when people ask me, and they usually ask me last recent days, uh, do I think that Russia will attack now? Uh, my answer is no. And my answer, based, I'm, I'm not sure, of course, because they can, but I, think, I don't think so. And my prediction, my uh, understanding of the situation and my answer based on two main ideas. First, logic, and then a next and second, uh, like emotional moment. The logic tells me that Putin will attack uh, when we will not expect it. And now he's playing a show. He's trying to show us that he, the, all these troops and everyone can see this and like so on and so forth. So it's not unpredictable. And um, I think that if he will attack us next time, it will be the same uh, approach than he used during like Crimea operation. He will attack. Uh, he will attack unexpectedly. And now it's just a show. But there is a second very important reason why I don't think so. Not logic, but emotion. Uh, the direct attack, direct aggression, will unite people. Will unite people inside Ukraine or and in in all the world, and will unite alliance. So diet aggression will brings him to the totally opposite result that he wants to achieve. That's why I don't think he will attack, but it doesn't mean that we'll have no problems with it. Uh, he's playing on the multiple fields and you every day can see something and hear something about his play. Uh, political murders, support of dictators, creating crises and threats. He combines tsunami tactics and tactics of thousand cuts to undermine 
and to destroy, to, to challenge Western values and turn them into a weapon against democracy. And I will show a couple of examples how it happened. It's very, it's very easy to understand it, but when you see this like in, in a combined picture, it's better to, 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 to make a right um, decisions after this. If the West declares that the democratic values are more important than money, so Russia gonna check it. How much you are ready to pay for them? And they create in the North Stream second. It's not been a business project. It's a project to divide, economically divide Europe. And after this division, he creates absolutely artificial energy crisis to show how it works. And the only reason why he plays this game is to demonstrate that the only value for, for Europe is to is money actually and everyone is obeying only their own interest it undermines democracy it undermines trust the second example the west declares that all people deserve a better life okay we'll see how many migrants you're ready to take and we will show you all the world we will show the pictures how your troops you know that not allow to, to 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 let people come into across the U.S. border. It's a pictures, it's emotions, but um, perception is reality, and he is creating this anti-democratic reality. He organizes crises, artificial crises, to undermine uh, Western values. The West declares freedom of speech. Okay. Let's see what amount of lies and conspiracies you can bear. And Putin has spent tons of resources to support conspiracy theories and support opponents of vaccination, for example, to undermine the trust in government. And when you are trying to push back to do something with it, He will accuse you in limiting of freedom of speech and show that it's a fake value for you, freedom of speech. The same with elections and democracy itself. If you believe and you like declare that you have honest or like fair elections, sorry. So get electoral fraud and doubt the legitimacy of elected officials not to trust your officials. So Putin interferes in the elections, in all, all these fears, he can show that Western values and democracy doesn't work. Why it happened? I believe that 75 years ago, American diplomat in Moscow, George Cannon sent his long telegram to share his views on position of Soviet Union towards the United States. But, but in reality, to, toward the old democratic world. The West in the main ideological enemy of Soviet Union and the Kremlin aimed to breed mistrust, breed division among democratic countries and inside countries, suspicious between partners, parties, social groups, and citizens. Soviet authorities recognized only power. Since then, almost nothing has changed in Kremlin's policy, except one very important point, it's ideology. Now they don't spread communism, but the new ideology concept, ideological concept they share is Rus Mir, Russian world. What is the difference? From my point of view, the main difference that communism uh, was a symbol uh, and the division was in economic sphere so communism first of all showed that economy could be built in a different way and now this difference from my point of view is much deeper russian world what is russian world 
of course we can we can discuss about it and it's uh, the roots of, of this concept goes very deep like all these ideas that Moscow is a third Rome and so on and so forth but to simplify it to understand it I would say that the the simply simplifying definition of this Russian world is a Slavic nation with Orthodox Christianity religion called to save the civilization from all decay so they are trying they are living in the world in which they should save the civilization and they it looks like they protect themselves for them liberal values such as diversity freedom of thinking and speech lgbt rights are nothing more than aspects of moral decay and it's very important to understand it because it's not about interest so you, you can make agreement about it they appeal that you uh, your existence already creates a threat for them and it's it's like a holy war it's like a holy war if you think that i'm i'm joking or exaggerating ask this guy i don't know if putin himself really believes in it but he did convince a dozen million people in the world of it and not only in russia in this war the trust is the main target not the territory not the resources but trust and as far as trust as a basic for democracy the target is democracy and not only for propaganda it's not like they're playing only in Facebook or on media. It's not. To undermine trust, they invest resources not only in conspiracy theories and information campaigns. They provoke in conflicts, organizing sabotage and coups, destroying people's privacy and even killing them. The final goal of all this spectrum of play is to undermine democratic institution destroying trust and creating chaos and that's why it's not a crisis of democracy in the world this black backsliding of democracy we have now it's not because of crisis it's because of war i think that this backsliding is an effect direct effect of these efforts the countries like russia and kremlin first of all ukraine in this war is only a symbolic target because of three reasons first ukraine is slavic mostly orthodox country but with uh, western values but with, with very strong western values and it creates a critical ideological problem for the concept of russian world second ukraine is a perfect example how democracy works in our region and for Putin, it's absolutely unacceptable to allow Ukraine to become successful. Third, the success of democratic Ukraine will start brain drain from Russia because free people want to live in a free country. And to create conditions for the export of democracy far to the East. That's why the conclusion is very simple. Ukraine was attacked not because of some conflicts territories resources but because of our choice democratic choice and that's why actually this war relates to every of you to all of us and not only to ukraine to win this war we should realize that it's not a crisis but a war and we need as Ambassador McFall already mentioned in his article, recent article, bold decisions, not an incremental policy. And I'll try to, to share some of my ideas about the possible decisions it's necessary to do as soon as possible. First of all, to change sanction policy. 
because existing model doesn't work. I will explain why further. To disarm Russian informational weapons. Third, to establish Marshall Plan for fragile democracies. These countries do really need support. To rethink model of United Security, Nation Security Council and to give to fragile democracy a clear signal that they are not alone and they can rely on the real military support because this military threat in these countries are very real. Speaking about sanctions policy, it's very interesting block, maybe the most complicated and interesting block. Existing model of sanctions doesn't work because of very easy explanation. They doesn't change the aggressor's behavior. Nothing happens. Current sanctions against Russia can be compared with the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. Again, the Kissinger describes in his diplomacy uh, that the treaty was insufficient to leave Germany weak, but severe enough to push it for demanding revenge. And this revenge came with Hitler. Sanctions imposed on Russia have more or less the same effect. They are insufficient to force the Kremlin to change the policy, but enough to accumulate anger and provoke them to attack democracy. What's wrong with these sanctions? Three main mistakes. First, these sanctions, the model of these sanctions looks like a challenge for strongmen. So it's a decision politicians about politicians. And in this situation, the only way for a strong man is to push back. Sanctions shouldn't be a political decision. They should be predictable and looks like more like the result of some judgment, not a political battle or political competition. Second, sanctions creates a wrong incentives. They are not strong enough to win, but enough, but strong enough to make an aggressor angry. In this situation, the strong man will try to interfere in democratic countries' internal policy, but not to solve the reason why sanctions were imposed. The third, the time and the main actual weakness that existing model of sanctions create a situation when the time is playing against, runs against a victim. It's very easy. Every year, the Crimean annexation become more and more, not a political issue, but a historical event. Every year, it becomes harder and harder to maintain and keep sanctions. Every year for politicians, for Western politicians, every year, the sanctions become less and less efficient because of economic adaptation. And as a result, it becomes harder for Western world, for Western leaders to continue sanctions every year. So one day they will be useless, outdated, and will be removed. And it will create a huge symbolic damage for the world order. This is what Russia wants to achieve. Kremlin actually wants to achieve. To cement existing status and ensure that the next generation of Western politicians will change their behavior. Will be more like flexible, if I may. That's why existing sanctions model will not bring us to a result. We should change it. And the solution is could be could be called like smart sanctions or cascade sanctions or other name, but the sense is very important. They should be predictable, not to challenge, but to be a predictable result of some violence. They should be should imposed by the juridical, but not a political decision. Maybe some, I don't know, international court, a separate institution to create the right incentives. And the third, they should be formed like a package of measures till a total isolation in five, 10 years 
which will be erased automatically every period of time if the problem is not solved. Because in this case, there is no any reason to push back. So you inevitably will be isolated in some period of time if you will not uh, like solve the problem. And it will turn the effect of, of time and time should run against the aggressor. It's very important to change this uh, situation. The second very important solution is to disarm Russian informational weapons. We should accept that some media, actually not media, but I don't know, informational tools, I would say, like Russia Today, for example, are used as a weapon pointed against democracy, trust, and truth. And that it's not about freedom of speech. It's about freedom to protect yourself from coordinated and well-organized informational aggression. So I have a multiple question. Why, for example, Trump is blocked from Twitter and Russia today is not. It's very simple. And a lot of questions, actually, we can discuss. The third, Marshall Plan for Fragile Democracies. In fragile countries, in fragile democracies, risks are very high. The price of resources is very high. That's why it's, my, it's very important to have investments, loans, cooperation with the Western countries. Countries on the front line should receive support to make the economic modern and democracy sustainable. That's how it was happened after the World War II, when the Marshall Plan protected Western Germany from sliding down into Soviet orbit. It's very important. It's not like to give them a money. No, it's a plan how to support them and to protect, to, to make sure that they're capable enough to move in the right direction. For example, just you to understand that Ukraine losses in this war estimated in hundreds of billion dollars, Crimea, Donbass, and all this stuff. Hundreds billion dollars. And the level of aid we have been receiving in like hundreds times less. It doesn't work like that. And it's not only about Ukraine. I, I, I believe it. a lot of countries needs the support now, direct support. Next, maintaining the resilience of democracies under threat. All these countries need a very clear political signal. I would say maybe more direct. The elites of these countries, regional elites, political elites, intellectual elites, the elites of these countries need the political signal for the, that, that they're not alone. Speaking about Ukraine, it's absolutely obvious that Ukraine should be a member of NATO. Because if Ukraine is not in NATO, it's more dangerous for everyone because Russia will do everything to block it. It provokes Russia to be more aggressive than if not. But for sure, Ukraine needs now a real solution of the problem of threat from the sea and from the sky. Because it's impossible to solve in existing world, it's impossible to solve this problem without alliance. It's just impossible. And the last but not least, I believe that we should rethink the model of UNSC. We need to reform the decision-making system on that level. Because it destroys, now it's, it's, it doesn't meet the requirements of our time. And it creates a problems for trust. It looks like United Nation can do anything or don't want to do anything. And it undermines the trust very well. Maybe, maybe permanent members of this council shouldn't have veto power for the issues they are involved in. But I'm not the best expert in it. But for sure what I know, what do I know, that 
without solving this problem, we will have no clear mechanism how to solve these, these conflicts in the future. And Crimea actually is a perfect indicator uh, of this, of efficiency of these mechanisms. Summit of democracy. A lot of people recent weeks asked me, what do I think about it? And I'm sure that the President Biden created a very high expectation, not only here, but in Ukraine for sure, in, in our part of the world. Because uh, a lot of people were expected that United States came back to the battleground. And it's a huge responsibility not to betray these expectations now. That's why I hope that it's very, that they understand that it's very important to have a real fruitful summit. It's very important summit, not the empty, some empty events or like cameras taking the pictures and so on and so forth. And I believe that understanding that it's not a crisis, but a war is a key element of the preparation to this summit because it, 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 it will help them to understand that bold decisions is much better than uh, the incremental policy or trying to negotiate some problems on a regional level or something else. It's impossible because as Mr. Cannon one more time said, a certain democratic country is an enemy of, of Russia. The enemy is a democracy itself. I do believe that it's very right and very, very true uh, statement and assessment. Uh, I believe that dozen, pe dozen million people in the world now are waiting when the West will wake up and realize that the war for democracy is not cold anymore. In our region, for sure, it's not cold. It's extremely hot and it takes people's life day by day. And Ukraine is already totally in this war. And it's time to open the second front from the Western part of the world. Because if not, we'll see that a front line of this war is not a line on the map anymore. It's already around us. That's my, I believe, short presentation. And uh, that's why I think that it's a critical time before the summit to discuss these topics and to propose some maybe controversial, maybe dis decisions or proposition for discussion. But we, absolutely shouldn't hide this problem. And we absolutely should understand that it's not a crisis and it, it's impossible to avoid it. And we should solve it together. I believe it is possible and we will win. Democracy will, 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 will prevail in this fight. And this place, Stanford University is maybe the best place to discuss the new ideas, how to meet all these challenges. Thank you very much for attention. Yes, thank you very much. I'll mm -hmm. grab this. I know I think they're going to turn on our microphones. Yeah, cool, good. Thank you very much, Alexei. That was, uh, it was provocative it would, and uh, informative. And um, I know we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, I'm just gonna uh, start um, by asking the, the first question. Um, and then um, when, after Alexei is finished, if you in the audience have questions, please come up to the microphones uh, here one at a time, maintaining social distance um, and uh, go ahead and ask your question and then we'll, turn to the Zoom audience and get questions from them um, as well. So Alexei, um, you, you um, presented this sort of alternative vision that mm -hmm. you think Vladimir Putin um, and, and uh, Russia um, wants to put forward, which is, is this Ruskimir idea, Russia's Russian world. 
Slavic Orthodox out to save civilization against an overly liberal permissive yeah. West um, and, and prevent the moral decay that mm -hmm. will come uh, from, from the West. So my question is, isn't this instrumental? I mean, is this, how much does, does Putin and Russia, how much do they really believe this? It, it seems to me that it's, it's not something that's actually widely shared within the Russian people themselves, but within this particular political regime that is now ruling Russia. And so if we had another, you know, someday Mr. Putin will die. Uh, we, we all must face that, of course. He's just turned 69 years old, so he's already a year older than the average Russian man. Um, exercises like a fiend, apparently. Um, not a heavy drinker, uh, not a heavy smoker. Um, rumors that he may be having health problems, we don't know. But if we had a different president than this one, um, who has suddenly gotten religion uh, and nationalism, would this attack uh, on democracy, as you put it, uh, go away from Russia or, or would it change? Or is this bigger than Putin, do you think, and this regime? It's a perfect question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I believe that um, the reason why Russia is so aggressive uh, was changed during this time, mm -hmm. last like 20 years maybe. And um, I don't think that Putin really believes in all these like fairy tales. I think that uh, Putin and the, his Kremlin crowd is a corrupted regime, and they are trying to save their like position and keep control over the country. And to and all these stories, fairy tales, is only the tools. Uh, to the, the, the poison, poison ideas to contain or to uh, make the people misoriented in Russia. But uh, when, uh, so I, I believe that preliminary 15, maybe a little bit more years uh, ago, these ideas was, was created. Uh, but when you, described or trying to convince somebody a long period of time you started to believe this yeah so this idea becomes your mindset that's why i don't know uh, maybe some of these people on the top of kremlin top of russia really believe this but it doesn't matter because believe them uh, this idea or not they creates a huge a tons of problems for the West. They invest into propaganda. They for sure are uh, trying to share these ideas uh, abroad. So to Ukraine, for sure. I know a lot of people, even in Ukraine, who share something like I just described. And for some people, uh the the religion is is more important for some people the uh land is more important the blood or some some other element but the general picture is to explain that there is a russian nation russian world and this is and they uh have some special pass and the way and the the the, the, the reason why they uh, go in this special pass is to save the world to to so they 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 think that it's absolutely necessary to have some big idea, some big dream, mm -hmm. to it's an exceptional country, absolutely. An exceptional civilization, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And everyone around is against them. Uh -huh. It's against them. So they need to have a big enemy. And uh, now almost all countries around is an enemies. Mm -hmm. Canada actually is the one of the biggest enemies for Russia. Actually, yeah. why? Canada, come on. I know. You know, but uh, Canadian, that's but what he's saying. <laughs> that's 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 why we should understand that it's yeah. not about country. Yeah, it's not about Ukraine, uh, Canada, or so on and so forth. Unfortunately, Ukraine is next to Russia. And absolutely unfortunately for them, our choice was democratic. Mm -hmm. And that was a reason, that was a moment when we 
uh, started having problems with yeah. that. Yeah, Canada, I mean, Canada has a big Ukrainian diaspora as well. So that's, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks. Uh, in, interesting answer. Um, I see people at the microphones and I think I'll turn to Ambassador McFall, director of the Freeman Spogli Institute with the first question. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yep. We can. okay. Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic talk. Thank you for being so expansive and big in your talk, Alexei. Um, I wanna talk less about Russia. I wanna talk more about Ukraine. Um, when we have debates here in America about foreign influences and Russian influence on our elections and polarization and disinformation, propaganda, uh, people that know America better than me, and some of them are in this room, always remind those looking at Russia that they always remind us that we, if there weren't some bases, if there weren't some ideological allies for those ideas, they would not be able to be amplified, right? So the problem's at home. Yep. Um, as well as interacting with the problem abroad. Now, I in no way want to make the false comparison to what Russia has done to your country versus mine, but I want to talk a little bit more about that interaction. And I want you to go into the weeds, if you will, about four, actually I have 12, but I'm just going to ask four, uh, four <laughs> different kinds of groups in Ukraine and tell us a little bit more about how they react to Ruski Mir and Putin. Are they allies? Are they enemies? Or are they ineffective enemies? That's the thing I want to talk about, especially about small D Democrats. So one, tell us more about people in Crimea. What do they think about this? Two, tell us more, and I'm really interested in this question, given your knowledge and where you're from, about people in Donbass. If there was a real election today, how do they feel about Ruski Mir? How do they feel about Kiev? Are they allies or are they prisoners of what Putin is doing? Third, dig a little deeper into the oligarchs, to economic interest. If you don't like the word oligarchs, call it economic interest groups. <laughs> um, and, and tell us a little bit about, are some helping Putin and Putinism in your country? Uh, are others repelling it? I want to I understand the contours of how that group set of Ukrainian actors. And then fourth, I'll just call it, and you can take it in any way you want, small d Democrats. Uh, I'm a member of the Democratic Party, and when we lost in 2016, lots of Democrats said, well, the Russians delivered this election to Trump. Uh, but some people said, well, maybe the Democrats weren't so good in that election, right? Maybe there's some self-reflection about our candidate, our party. And I'm wondering how you evaluate small d Democrats. How are they doing in fighting Putinism, Ruski Mir? Um, and, you know, maybe you have some thoughts about how... Uh, uh, either domestically or internally, those groups could be strengthened. But take us a little bit into the contours of Ukrainian society as a recipient or not of these ideas that are being forced upon your country. Thank you very much. Uh, I took notes as well. So. The same. Okay. <laughs> uh, perfect question. I, I believe the answer uh, will take me a day. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. So, uh, Crimea. Uh, historically, in Crimea, there were a lot of people who uh, felt themselves very related or connected to Russia, historically. And now the situation is much worse for Ukraine because of two reasons. A lot of people moved from Ukraine, from, from Crimea to Ukraine. It's a dozen thousand people, maybe more, but something like that. For sure, a huge part of Crimea Tatar, for example. And the uh, second Russia moved forced to move hundreds thousands people from Russia, originally from Russia to Crimea. So now uh, when you ask me about what do people think about Ukraine in Crimea, I would ask you what kind of people, what people? The person who just moved from Novosibirsk, the answer is clear, yeah? So, uh, 
I would say that a lot of people in Ukraine, inside Ukraine, from Crimea originally, and I have a lot of friends from Crimea, uh, are ready to fight for Crimea. And I'm sure that someday Crimea will uh, come back. Uh, Donbass. Uh, I shared the number 1.6 million people moved from Donbass to Ukraine. And I know a lot of people who live now, how, now are living in Donbass and Kyiv at the same time. So they are living two lives the same one day. So I would say that in Donbass, because of propaganda, a lot of people and personal experience actually, uh, people, a lot of people hate Ukrainian troops. But for sure, the majority of people, the total majority of people, wants to live in peace. The main their demand, guys, we don't want to be involved in the politics. We want to live in peace. So the majority pro-Ukrainian people or already moved to the territory of Ukraine or are living life in both sides. But the majority of people who live exactly in Donbass region, it's very complicated life now, especially if you support Ukraine, it's very complicated. So a huge part of that people, they want to live in peace. That's my general understanding of the situation. Uh, oligarchs. When I started preparing to this lecture, I uh, called to three people uh, in Ukraine to ask about these recent events uh, with Russia. So are they scared or not? What is the general temperature? What is the understanding, general understanding among elites? And all these people are very well informed in what, what happened in, 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 in Kyiv and in, in Ukraine in general. All of them told me that the oligarchs are scared because of this Russian, uh, Russian game. They're scared. So I would say that all of them, even those oligarchs who support, openly support pro-Russian forces, except Medvedchuk, because Medvedchuk is absolutely separate guy. He's not oligarch. He's the agent uh, of Russia. So his oligarch, it's not his main uh, description, if you may, status. Can you just explain for people who may not know who that is? Uh, Medvedchuk is a relative of Mr. Putin. Uh, he is a person uh, during 90s deeply involved in Ukrainian politics. And then for uh, after the revolution, Orange Revolution moved from Ukraine. Uh, and then when Yanukovych uh, started being, a pro, uh, was elected as a president, he came back and started very active with his pro-Russian projects. So he is not like, he's not the original actor of our political life. He's absolutely clear in the, like, came from Moscow to support, openly protect uh, Russian uh, line and uh, Russian direction. So he's, it's an opposite uh, person. But all Ukrainian oligarchs are scared because they don't want to uh, appear one day in the Russian world, for sure. Um, but because of, political spectrum, some oligarchs have chosen the pro-Russian political win. That's why they are playing, uh, I don't know, in very dangerous ground, I would say, because they, they are not support Russia openly, but they are playing like in between. But even them are very scared now. Uh, when the war started, 
uh, almost all oligarchs supported by their finances and organizational capacities uh, supported uh, volunteers uh, to, to push back in Russia. So um, it's, it's, it's more or less pro-Ukrainian part of our society. The Democrats. Ukraine has very strong civil society. And the reason why Putin uh, controls only Donbass and Crimea is only because all these small Democrats or civil society is exist. Because all these people, volunteers, made a huge effort, actually. And we actually have here, even in this room, some Democrats, small Democrats. So it's not only in Ukraine. Only because of efforts of these thousands of people, we still have Ukrainian Kharkiv, Ukrainian Odessa, Ukrainian Dnepropetrovsk, and so on and so forth. So I believe that it's a main value now in our society. And it's a absolutely incredible uh, like point that we still have all these people uh, in Ukraine, and all these people still fighting for our freedom and for our uh, against Russia, actually. All right, that was good. Uh, I see it was I... a short answer. Yeah, no, yeah, that Sorry. was very masterful. Um, all right, um, could you introduce yourself and uh, ask your question, please? Sure. Hi, Prime Minister. My name is Divya Ganesan, and I'm a freshman here. Um, and first, thank you for sharing all of your insights. And it was great to hear. I'm taking lots of classes on democracy right now, but it's really great to hear how the application is like. Um, my question is surrounding social media. We live on Silicon Valley, um, which, you know, we're here, but the extent of our actions expand much more. And I'm wondering what role you think social media companies have in the war for democracy in Ukraine and, um, and their role in regulating the content that are on their platforms. Uh... Thank you for the perfect question. Uh, I agree that the general influence of social media, that uh, the more, the more, the more likes, you know, the more attention, the more advertisement you want to like have, the more division you will, uh, you will share. So I, I, I agree with all this general uh, understanding that Social media is very tricky, uh, like tricky, tricky instrument. But about Ukraine, uh, I would say that the revolution of dignity happened because of Facebook. I I, I know that it's a strong message, and it's 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 very I made mean, bold statement. But I believe it's true. Uh, and. Facebook was important, but Facebook, I mean, uh, like social media, you know, so tools able to, con to uh, allow people to connect with each other and to coordinate. Uh, but for example, Telegram now in Ukraine is playing absolutely opposite role. Is, uh, Telegram was used uh, and now is used by Russian propaganda uh, to uh, create and to share the uh, conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Belarus, it was opposite. Telegram played a perfect and a key role maybe uh, during this last event. So I believe that social media is only a, like a tool, you know? And in different countries, in different situations, they could be used in a different, uh, with a different effect. But especially for Ukraine, for Ukraine, for sure, social media had absolutely crucial, absolutely incredible role. And one more time, revolution of dignity from my point of view happened, was not happened actually, but was successful uh, because of, uh, Soviet of um, uh, social media. So you may or may not know this, but actually um, Mustafa Naim, who was the journalist, one of the one of the people who really used uh, Facebook and social media effectively to mobilize people in 2014 yeah. um, uh, in Ukraine, was uh, 
a summer fellow here in our Draper Hill Summer awesome. Fellows Program. You do know that. Okay. Yeah. Now you all know that too. Now so, he is a deputy that's... minister actually right in the, in the cabinet so. right 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 so that's how stanford overthrew yanukovych yeah um okay thanks for your question um how about over here uh, my name is Ksenia Kirillova, the Jamestown Foundation. Mm -hmm. I follow the Russian and Ukrainian war from the very beginning, so I cannot agree more. But a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, how you can evaluate an agreement of strategic partnership signed between uh, the United States and Ukraine last week? Because I think it's very important how it could practically change the situation. Uh, the second question you uh, said about some legal ground for imposing new sanctions on Russia. Could uh, the Crimean platform conducted in this August be a basis for this legal ground, for example, because so many countries signed it, it's probably it's possible to um, uh, create even new international courts based on these declarations that could be a ground for new sanctions. And just a couple of words about uh, Russian ideology. Um, in my opinion, Russia doesn't have its own ideology. It's created different ideologies for experts, so called for uh, different social groups, uh, primarily radical left, radical rights, and they contradict each other and contradict uh, real conditions of living in Russia. So it's possible to uh, counter Russian propaganda just, comparing, just by comparing these ideologies. Uh, with each other and with a real life in Russia. They have nothing to offer to other countries. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, agreement. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, the reaction now of Western leaders, uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, United States, of course, Canada, uh, is much better than uh, 70 years ago. Uh, so some lessons are learned. And of course, Ukraine and the United States are building some uh, instruments to cooperate and to uh, raise uh, Ukrainians' capacity. Thank you for this. But from my point of view, uh, of um, uh, from my point of view, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's only it could be a first step. It could be a framework. It would be I don't know uh, the general declaration, but it doesn't change a critical uh, critical difference between uh, understanding uh, all the situation as a war against democracy. I'm absolutely sure that we need now a bold decision not incremental policy one more time like uh, ambassador mcfall perfectly uh, mentioned in his article it's absolutely clear for me and this agreement is an incremental element it's a small element small piece and it doesn't work like this so it's good but it's not enough uh platform uh crimean platform is a good initiative i believe to uh, remind about, uh, about this annexation as an important political issue, but it is a political program, uh, platform. It couldn't be a, a institution uh, for, uh, to implement sanctions mm -hmm. because it's the same approach. My statement was to make sanctions not political, but juridical decision to change the logic of sanctions. Because when it's political decision, I'm a politician uh, and I, I decide signs about uh, other politicians. And I provoke this like strong man, this other politician to push back. Because if he is a strong man, in his ecosystem, he don't have like other choice than rather than push back. Right. Uh, Russian ideology, I agree with the statement, they, um, they create, they are very creative, and they create a multiple different rumors, stories, ideologies, myths, and so on and so forth, I agree, but there is a general framework, 
of this special path of this Moscow SSR dream and so on and so forth. And I, I was trying to describe simplification one more time, simplified picture, how it looks like to understand the general difference, general difference. It's not economical reasons. Mm -hmm. It's not a conflict. It's a holy war. They just believe, and a lot of people, dozen people, millions of people, believe that they have a special role to save us. Yeah? And the diversity, LGBT values, freedom of speech and freedom of things, it's a decay. This is, this is from my point of view, uh, uh, it's very important to understand. And I'm sure that it's not exaggeration. But question is perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I know we have a question here, and then I, I feel like I'm being signaled that there are some questions from Zoom. Right. Will you tell me what they are? Or are you going to read them? Yes. We'll go to the live person. We'll go over to, to Zoom. Yep. Go ahead. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, hi there, Prime Minister. My name is Suter Sinsundar. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your talk today. Really interesting. And um, I was wondering if you'd go into more detail on the background behind where the Russian world narrative came from and how that reflects on the, the Kremlin within Russian society and their position. The fact that the Kremlin has to resort to these tactics where they have to whip up national pride, where they have to whip up these narratives to become popular with the populace. Is that reflective of a decay of the power of the Kremlin within Russian society? Is that a reflection of the threat of democracy becoming real? That it's something that has become very appealing and they have to counter it with this war on democracy? Or is maybe that a misinformed perception of why they're going about this narrative, this war on democracy? Why they, uh, sorry, one more time, uh, the last sentence. Is it misinformed to think that they're going about this war on democracy as a response to the threat of democracy? Like it's something they're really facing that is undermining their political stability and their yeah. political might. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Kremlin is a, and Putin himself is a like corrupted elite, political elite. And they are trying to keep uh, the power to protect themselves inside the country. They, uh, the most, uh, dangerous thing they 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 have they afraid is their streets. So the Russian streets is the most dangerous for Kremlin, and they afraid not to have a people in the streets. And they are ready to pay and they are ready to uh, you know, force to attack the people who even probably will become a threat for them. Ukraine has a absolutely a totally connected uh, with Russian nations, totally. A lot of relatives, people who like were in the army together, university. So it, it, it was a more or less one historical you know, space because of Soviet Union. And these very strong roots creates an opportunity from Ukraine to export democracy into Russia. So they are very scared not to have a street from Ukraine to Russia. Uh, there is very one, one very uh, important moment, I believe. I just forgot about it, but the first Ukrainian flag, when Ukraine became uh, independent, the first flag Ukrainian came to the parliament, Ukrainian parliament. What a flag from the tank, from the tank, uh, from Moscow. So it, it's very interesting story. Because this, that was actually, that was a flag waving, uh, um, on, the, on, on one of the tanks mm -hmm. uh, in this, when, when this putsch happened mm -hmm. in Moscow. In, from 1991? Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's okay. a very interesting moment. Okay. And I just thought about it. So it's, it's a symbolically, on a symbolic level, on an economic level, on a social level, 
it's too very connected, connected informational fields, cultural fields, societies, and so on and so forth. Originally, for Russian people, it's very comfortable to be in Odessa, Kharkiv, uh, even Kiev. It's more or less the same cultural place. It's a rumor that it's a dangerous place for them. That's why for Russian elites, intellectual elites, creative class, the best place in the world to live is a free but Russian speaking surrounding. So Kiev, Odessa, uh, Kharkiv, and so on and so forth. And Putin and his guys are scared not to have a brain drain on the first stage. And then when all these people will just uh, come back to, to Russia and will bring democracy and all these values to Russia back. And I believe that they think that they understand that it's inevitable and they're trying to win some time, I don't know. But uh, for them, uh, they, they, they have two options. First, to make Ukraine non-free country, and it was an attempt during Yanukovych time. We had this chance, mm -hmm. not chance, but the danger, yeah. Or Ukraine shouldn't exist. Ukraine shouldn't exist. Odessa, Dnepropetrovsk, and Kharkiv, so our eastern part of the, uh, should be Russian or pro-Russian territory. It's too, uh, for, for them, it's two different acceptable options. And they're working on it. So independent and successful Ukraine, it's the end uh, for authoritarian uh, Kremlin policy. And yes, uh, it's, 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 it's a pushback, like you just said. They understand, they're scared. I, I have no any doubts on that. Great, thank you. Uh, why don't we pause and, and go over to Zoom and then we'll take your question. So we have a question here from Francis Bukuyama. Um, can you be more specific as to what kind of sanctions would be effective as opposed to those in place now? And what specifically the Summit for Democracy should do to support Ukraine? Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, I have a lot of ideas about specific sanctions, starting from, uh, I don't know, some bans for some trading operations and so on and so forth. And uh, it's, it, it, it's very broad number of possibilities, opportunities here. But I was speaking about the model. From my point of view, now sanctions are playing against Ukraine. Now, sanctions are playing against Ukraine because, one more time, every year it, it becomes harder and harder, sanctions become less effective and less effective, and the most important, that one day they will be inefficient and outdated. And the annexation become a historical event, not a political issue. Uh, and it creates an incentive to Putin to play, to push back and to force Western politicians, to influence them, to change their like behavior, not, not to continue support for Ukraine. From my point of view, the sanctions should be uh, like implemented one time for some period of time, but till the uh, total isolation. So to give Russia some time to understand that, okay, guys, you have five years, you have seven years to solve this problem. But if not, every year, sanctions automatically become stronger and stronger till the total isolation. And from my point of view, this is the only concept can push a strong man to solve a problem, not to undermine uh, like domestic policies, domestic um, uh, democracy. And it changed the uh, effect. And the main task of this new model is to turn the time against the aggressors. This is the main idea. From my point of view, the democratic sanctions, uh, the summits of democracy 
should solve the uh, multiple number of problems. First of all, to support, to provide the real support to fragile democracies. I called it in my presentation Marshall Plan, but it could have, I don't know, Blinken Plan or I don't know, Biden <laughs> Plan, I don't know. The, the name doesn't, doesn't matter, but the sense is important. These countries now under huge pressure, because of this pressure, the uh, resources are very expensive. It's impossible to grow in this condition because investors are scared because the loan are very expensive and so on and so forth. It's additional burdens for the economy. And it's impossible to well, not to understand it, I, I believe. You can just maybe close your eyes not to see this, but it's, it's absolutely obvious. And that's why I think that, for example, IMF plan is not enough because it's not about, I don't know, sustainability of economy or, or about reforms. It's about a war. And in this situation, such countries like Ukraine, such countries like I don't know, Moldova, Georgia, who has the military conflicts with the uh, Russia and with China, who are on the borders of these big aggressors, should have a clear uh, guarantees, a clear understanding that they are not alone. And they should have a tool, very concrete tool of support from the West to, uh, to, to, to have capacity to grow and to be a window of a successful democracy, not a failed democracy. It's like a Western uh, um, Germany. Mm -hmm. It was very important to create a good picture in the Western Germany, to be an example for uh, the countries in uh, uh, Western Europe at that period of time. I believe that the same task, exactly the same task we have now. Great, thank you, interesting. Um, did we have one more question or was, uh, did she? Oh, there you are, right, okay. And then we'll go back to Zoom question. Just have a few more minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Jessica Janowski. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I was curious what your ask is of young people like us, students at Stanford, in supporting the democratic cause of Ukraine? Great question. Oh, great question. I think that the first, uh, the first step is to visit Ukraine. Uh, you have my invitation. Everyone who, mm -hmm. who wants, you should visit it. You should visit it and have your personal experience from this visit. You would love this country. And after you will you visit uh, Ukraine, you will be a biggest supporter of Ukraine in the world, I'm sure, absolutely. Uh, that's why, so it's, it, and it's not a joke actually, because you can build it like connections with the same young people in Ukraine and help them to, to uh, understand how it works here to bring your values there. Maybe you can work there, make it, maybe you can do some project there. So this is the easiest way to, to support, uh, to support uh, Ukraine, I believe, to build your personal bridge uh, to that part of the world. And I believe we have some internships here at FSI that can facilitate that a little advertisement. Thanks, that was a wonderful answer to a wonderful question, 10, 10 minutes. Okay, um, how, how about we um, get this question here in the room and then do you have some more Zoom questions for us? Okay, yep, go ahead. Hi, Prime Minister, my name is Sasha. Thank you so much for your talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, you spoke very thoroughly about the fundamental differences between this concept of Ruski Mir and Western values. And I was just wondering, do you think there's any ideological overlap between the two or can they never cooperate with each other and Russia would need to fundamentally change from the ground up ideo ideologically in order for the two to work together? Uh, you know, it's a very good question. Of course, I, I believe there is some overlap. So like uh, in, in the song of my favorite rock, uh, uh, like singer Sting. I was going to say, is it Sting? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Russians love their children too. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, it's not like 
they're not like humans so there are a lot a lot of normal people there so i would say maybe even majority of normal people but they are living in a toxic uh, informational uh, uh, like uh, atmosphere and field and in this uh, toxic and day by day uh, i don't know i don't want to use strong language here uh, we, we know in, what in you this mean. holy place so uh, <laughs> but um, so my answer is okay of course of course there is some overlap and we can find it but the key element of russian world now is to save us from our values you know to save us from our values so if you believe in diversity for example you uh, they will try to save you and it's not a good idea uh, in ukraine we even have a joke that uh, be careful because russians will come and will try to save you <laughs> this is very sad joke i would say but th that that's why i'm an optimist and i believe that in 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 every situation we can find some like constructive answers but uh in my presentation i called russian world is a toxic concept because i believe that it's artificial and uh it was created to create a war you know the people who created this idea the reason the the purpose uh to create this idea to divide people that's my belief that's why i don't think that it's possible to match uh these ideas and this is this is the worst maybe uh part of my presentation actually that it's a holy war i believe they believe that we are not normal people and that our values that it's our decay you know and we we are trying to destroy their world you are trying to destroy their world no i i'm not you know and this uh, has nothing similar with reality but since in that part of the world it's a like dominated idea yeah there there is a a book uh, uh by robertson and green that talks about using culture as a wedge yeah. issue that putin uses that regime is using culture as a wedge issue to try and separate also Russians, right? Yeah. So, and and uh, and the white and rule, yeah, and minimize uh, sort of a more liberal influence, small l. Yeah. All right, one more question, maybe from Zoom, if we still have it. Sure. Um, I'll kind of paraphrase this. This comes from Anat Admati. So the question is: Are you better equipped to handle cyber attacks from Russia at this point? And can you sort of um, speak to Ukraine's experience? with cyber attacks and about the cyber attacks sorry uh, about uh, experience about cyber attacks yes yeah and and uh, anad is a professor at the business school um i'm not an expert in this sphere so uh i know that uh it was a couple of big attacks for like petya non petya uh on on uh, ukraine first of all in ukraine but i believe that it wasn't a real attack i thought i think that it was a test uh in case they will attack us military they will try to shut down all our infrastructure and energy objects and i think they were trying to 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 test our i don't know resilience how it's called uh so i think that uh putin uh um still has something to surprise us mm -hmm. here I, I i i think i think that ukraine is very fragile in this uh uh in this element and um but i i have a lot of information but i don't feel like i can I can comment it because mm -hmm. of, of, of multiple reasons. Right. So my general yeah. answer 
is that is a big threat, is a real threat, and I believe that Russian uh, like still uh, like didn't show us the oh, their capable. real yeah the real power. Right. So there can be more. Last question um, is uh, Nuriman. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Nuriman Ustaev. Thank you, Alex. Great lecture. It was full of insights. Uh, the current crisis along the European Union, Union Eastern borders is the other step by Putin uh, to insert Russia deeply into Western politics. Uh, and I mean uh, the crisis with migrants in which actually artificially created by Lukashenko's regime and the uh, uh, Kremlin's military activities along Ukraine. And uh, my question is um, about what do you think, uh, do European leaders realize the uh, enormous challenge which uh, they faced and how it will shape to the future of the European Union? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like one more time. Russians already very deep in Western politics, already. So it's not like a perspective. They already organized a coup in like Northern Macedonia, yeah? yeah? Yeah. So one more time, they already organized a coup in other countries. And it's only one of the examples. Uh, I used in my presentation only four examples, but they, they have like, tons of examples, even, even here in the United States. Uh, so I think that just like I mentioned in my presentation, that front line is around us. Front line is not a, a line on the map anymore. So it was some, some, I don't know, many years ago it was like that, but it, it, now it's not. And as soon as we understand this, as soon as Western leaders understand this, that the situation is very serious. And this is war not for like territory to control Ukraine or not to control Ukraine, uh, uh, like some uh, resources to control more NAFTA or, or, or more or less oil and gas. So it's not about this. It's about ideas. It's about conceptual existence. It's, they feel like if the Western world will share the democracy further, they will die. Mm. For them, it's, it's a fight for death. And they already push them back and we are not. It's like Putin, Putin doesn't play chess anymore. You know this from a famous phrase about chess. Mm. He doesn't play chess anymore. Uh, and he already have a gun in his hand and uh, we still play in marbles. That's, that's how I feel this. Of course, Western leaders, one more time, the reaction of Western leaders uh, is more correct. Uh, and thank you for this, but it's not enough. I believe that if we will be so passive as, as we are now, uh, we will pay just bigger price for it. Mm -hmm. So everything will be okay. And like anyway, democracy will prevail and we will win. So I'm an optimist, but uh, the price will be much higher. Yeah, this and, is a problem. And it's already been very high uh, for Ukraine. I should mention that Norman is one of our three uh, Ukrainian emerging leaders at CDGRL this year. Um, all right, well, Alexei, thank you. That was just thank incredibly, uh, an incredibly good talk, incredibly uh, great questions from the, uh, from the audience and your answers were really thorough and, and insightful. So thank you all so much for, for coming uh, this afternoon, now evening. Thank you all on Zoom for listening in and your wonderful questions. And um, join me, please, in uh, thanking uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Hancharok in particular. Thank you, Catherine, for the perfect moderation. Thank you. <laughs>